Hey, what's up everyone? This is Greg. Welcome back to our Intermediate Core Data video tutorial series. In this video, we'll look at setting up multiple managed object contexts in a parent-child relationship. There are many reasons for doing so, and we'll look at making persistence faster as our motivating example. As you saw in video 1 on the Core Data stack, when you set up a managed object context, the initializer takes a concurrency type parameter. The old default mode that's still around for backwards compatibility is thread confinement mode. That means that whichever thread you're on when you create the managed object context becomes the owning thread. But it's up to you to make sure that you always access the context on that thread or bad things will happen. This mode is now deprecated and you'll still see it in the headers and documentation, but you shouldn't actually use it yourself. You've already seen the main queue concurrency type, which links the managed object context with the main queue. Since all of your user interface work needs to be done on the main queue, this is the one we've been using so far. If you're accessing core data objects to then set and get properties on your labels and buttons, then this is the one to use. The final option in the set is the private queue concurrency type. This will take things off of the main thread into their own queue. You shouldn't mix UI work with private queues, but you can do things like background processing, such as importing and exporting large amounts of data. Aside from concurrency types, you also associated the managed object context with a persistent store. In our current core data stack, the managed object context on the main queue was directly connected to the persistent store. You can connect a managed object context on a private queue to the persistent store as well to do things like a long running export task that won't block the main queue. You can also set up a managed object context as a child of another managed object context rather than connecting it directly to a persistent store. That means you can create new objects on the child context, and only when you save the child context will those changes make it back to the parent. Similar to database transactions, making your changes on a child context makes undo very easy. The child context is like a separate scratch pad or working area, and you can just not save the child context and discard it. Then the data in the parent context will be unaffected. In the demo, we'll set up the core data stack with a parent and child context. The idea here is that the persistent store will be connected to a managed object context on a private queue, and then the actual managed object context that we use on the main queue will be a child. Why would you set things up like this? The idea here is to make operations on the main queue fast. Saving something on the main queue will only push those changes up to the parent, the private queue context. When you then save the private queue context, the actual heavy lifting of writing data to disk will be done off the main queue. If you have a lot of data, this will help keep the disk access part running on a separate queue that's not blocking the user interface. I'm here in the device detail table view controller, which shows the details on our selected device. And I'm going to scroll down to view will disappear, which is where I have the code that does the save. We have two cases here. If it's a existing device, then it updates the details. If it's a new device, then it creates a new managed object and then updates the details. And then we have this save command at the bottom. I'm going to add a little bit of code before and after the save just to keep track of the current time. And that'll be a very rough way to tell how long the save took. I'm getting the current start time and then saving the stack and then I'm going to get the end time and then calculate the elapsed time between them and I'm going to multiply by a thousand to turn it into milliseconds because the number of seconds is going to be a fraction. It's going to be a small number so we'll just get a little bit of not such a small decimal to look at and I'm just going to print out how many milliseconds that took. Let's build and run the app just so we have a baseline idea of how long this is going to take. Now the reason I'm doing this is you'll notice that if I have a 
record with an image, even if I don't change the image the way the app is written. I'm going to tap devices. Now, when I tap this, you'll see the word devices turn gray and just see how long it stays gray. So I'm going to tap it and we've gone back. And you can see saving the context, it says took about 90 milliseconds. Let me go in and add an image. And I'm going to hit back. And you'll see it took over a second, 1.1. There we got about 300 milliseconds. I'm going to hit back. There's a reasonably noticeable delay there, anywhere from over a second to 300 milliseconds. If I have a record that doesn't have an image, it's relatively quick. But the ones that do have an image, you can see take a little bit of time. All right. And that's what we're going to try to fix by splitting up our context. Let's open up the core data stack here and have a look. This is my current single managed object context. It's of a main queue concurrency type, and it's directly connected to the persistent store coordinator. Let me go ahead and add our new private queue context. That's going to be the one that's connected to the persistent store to begin with. I'm just going to call it the save manage object context because this manage object context job in life is just going to be to save and to load, but just to work with the persistent store on disk. The code here looks pretty familiar to what we already have down here, except I'm creating this as a private queue concurrency type attaching the persistent store coordinator, and we're going to return that. So that's going to be our manage object context that's going to be responsible for saving. Well, in this case, we want it to speed up saving. Now let's look at our main manage object context that we're actually going to use. Let me also actually make this one private, just to make sure that no one outside here messes with it. Now for our main manage object context, I'm going to leave that on the main queue. But instead of connecting the persistent store, I'm going to instead connect it as it's going to have a parent context. So this is going to be a child now of the save managed object context. And that's all I need to do to change those two. Now let's head all the way up to our save method, which is pretty simple now. We're just checking if it has changes. And if it does, it'll save. That will still work. But remember, if since this is now a child context, all the save is going to do is move the changes up to the parent context, but we still have to then save the parent context to make sure that that gets saved to disk. Let's have a look at how we're going to refactor this one. We'll use the handy new Swift 2 guard syntax, and I'm going to make sure that either the manage object context has changes or the save manage object context has changes. And if one of them has changes, we can continue. If they both do not have changes, then we're just going to return. That's going to be the easy case. And now we need to save in two parts. First, I'm going to save the managed object context. And because that's on the main queue, I'm going to have to make sure that this is running on the main queue. Let's go ahead and start with that. I'm using the perform block and wait method because this is going to perform this block of code in the correct queue. And again, in this case, manage object context is on the main queue. So this is going to run on the main queue. We're going to try and save it. And as usual, if there's a problem, we'll just call fatal error. And because I'm using perform block and wait, it'll actually run all of this code inside the block synchronously. Once that's done, we can then save the save manage object context. And again, we're going to make sure we do that on the correct queue. But this time we can do it asynchronously because that's on a private queue. It'll be running on a background thread. And that's the part that we don't need to wait for.
This time we're using regular perform block because we can run it asynchronously. And then inside, it's just the same kind of thing. We're going to save it and catch an error if there is an error. That's our revamped save method. Let's go ahead and build and run and see what we've done with the timings. Let's see how we do with the existing images. I've got this open. I'm going to hit the back button. Down to half a millisecond. Let's look at this one. Again, 0.1 of a millisecond, major decrease. Remember, the first one was somewhere in the order of 300 milliseconds, and the second one was even above a second, above 1,000 milliseconds. And we've cut that down by several orders of magnitude. Let me go ahead and try to add a new image and see how that does. I'll just select one of my simulator samples from the library here. And I'm going to hit the back button. And you can see again, we're under a millisecond now. So a massive improvement in the save. And then you can see that we're, we have one that's over a millisecond, but generally we're now under. So a big improvement because we're doing the hard work of actually saving to disk and working with the persistent store and the persistent store coordinator that's now going on a background thread separate from the main queue. That's it for this video tutorial. And as always, we like to leave you with a challenge. You'll set up a child context and simulate a long running task such as an export. You'll try it on the main queue first to see how it blocks the user interface and then move it on to a private queue context to see the difference. I hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.